Okay, um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are, what time is in your country. Um, my name is uh, Francisco Panizza. I am professor of Latin American and Comparative Politics at the London School of Economics, and I will be chairing this meeting. Uh, now, when you uh, chair this meeting, your first duty is to set some, to introduce the speakers and to set some uh, good things about them. Uh, in this particular case, it is my personal pleasure and privilege to introduce three speakers whose work I am familiar with and I highly uh, admire. Uh, some of you, I know you personally, but others know, but I really know your work and, and, and it's really a privilege to, to, to share this seminar with you. Um, so <clears throat> this is a, a meeting about criminal violence and uh, the state in Latin America. And uh, I think there are few um, social issues that are so relevant for uh, understanding Latin America that, uh, that the question of of criminal violence, which is both pervas pervasive and seemingly intractable in the region. Of course, like everything in Latin America, it tends to vary from uh, region to region, but uh, nowhere in the region is, is, is trivial. And I said that uh, it, it is important to understand uh, Latin America be because of um, what it says about the region and what it says and in impact it has on politics and on democratic institutions. Uh, because criminal violence is um, at the same time a, a cause of the uh, weakness of democracy in the region, but also a driver of uh, many other social pathologies. And uh, um, I think it's quite appropriate to center this in the role of the state in, uh, in, 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 ex in understanding and explaining uh, why the, the situation in Latin America is as it is re regarding criminal violence. And for this, we have uh, three first class uh, speakers, which I will very briefly introduce. Um, I think in, in, in order of their appear appearance, uh, first is Javier Aullero, um, he's professor in Latin American sociology at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, he holds a PhD in sociology at the New School for Social Research. Uh, he's born in Argentina, and his main areas of research are urban marginality, political ethnography, and collective violence. Now, um, all, this, all, all, all the participants have a very, very large list of publications, so I'm not going through all at least in, in terms of Javier, um, I think that uh, uh, particularly relevant is the book he has published uh, quite recently, the, the Ambivalent State, Police, Criminal Collusion in the Urban March, Margins, published uh, a couple of years ago with, with Catherine Sovereign. Um, second in the order of appearance is uh, Lucia Danmet, uh, Professor of International Relations at the Universidad de Chile. Uh, with a PhD from Leiden University. Uh, she was born in Peru, and her research interest is in the field of public security, criminal organizations, and justice reform. Um, <clears throat> among her uh, most recent books in English are Maras with Thomas Bruno and Fear of Crime in Latin America. Uh, Lucia has held key advisory positions in Chile, Argentina, Mexico, and Peru and has served as a key advisor at the Organization of American States and other regional organizations. Now, um, I always said when uh, you have two Uruguayans in a meeting, we are statistically overrepresented. So um, it, it is my personal pleasure to introduce a fellow Uruguayan, um, Juan Pablo Luna. Uh, also, um, he uh, has a, most of his professional career has been uh, in, in Chile, where he has lived a long, long time, perhaps as long as I have lived in, in England. Um, Pablo, Juan Pablo is um, 
currently a faculty member at the Political Science Institute and professor at the Government School of the uh, Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Um, and he's also an associate researcher at the Millennium Institute for Foundational Research on Data. Uh, he has a PhD from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and his main areas of research are state capacity, democratic representation, and the political effects of inequality. Again, uh, Juan Pablo, like the other uh, participant, has a large list of publications. Um, he is the author of Segmented Representation, Political Party Strategies in Unequal Democracies, and Instead of Optimism, Crisis of Political Representation in Chile today. So welcome all uh, to this webinar. Um, the rules, as um, was, was said, um, is for you to speak uh, 15 minutes each, and then we will open the forum. Uh, I just want to tend to, to, to thank um, Diego Sasso for organizing this meeting, and Kirsty, a uh, fellow uh, Manchester United supporter, for uh, her technical assistant on that. Um, Javier, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. I might have uh, misunderstood. Uh, you said Manchester United. I, I thought we were yeah. going to talk about. I thought we were going to talk about Leeds uh, to, today. <laughs> okay, so here we go. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for thank you for having me, and thanks for the uh, invitation. I would I would like to um, sort of briefly summarize some of the contents of of the book, The Ambivalent State, which just came out in in Argentina as Entre Narcos y, y Policías, um, and 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 then sort of discuss some of the larger implications of the work that still uh, continues. I assume most people have not uh, read The Ambivalent State. Why would you do that during the, this pandemic year? I don't know. So, um, so let me let me summarize it for you. It's it's a book based on the analysis of several court cases that contain a wiretap uh, conversations conversations between uh, police uh, officers and uh, traffickers, and long term uh, field work in a high poor uh, high crime neighborhood in Buenos Aires fieldwork that has now moved to another uh, barrio in collaboration with a young uh, resident, a uh, young anthropologist too, who was born and raised uh, there. Her name is Sofia Serbian, and we're continuing this uh, work. So a lot of the things I'm going to say today are, you know, uh, are the result of this ongoing collaboration. As, as we all know, if we are uh, here, doing the first decades of the 21st century, most Latin American countries have witnessed an increase in urban violence, making Latin America the only region in the world where lethal violence granted measure in this highly masculinized way of capturing violence, which is by homicide rates. Um, that lethal violence is still growing without being at war. The current pandemic, as far as we know, has slowed the growth of in certain areas, but not others, and certainly not all types uh, of crime. Reports from, say, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation shows that domestic violence has been increasing rapidly. Um, this violence, urban violence, most analysts would agree, is not democratic, is not evenly distributed in either socially nor geographically, and instead clusters in, in what we call territories of urban relegation, where the urban poor live, called them favelas, colonias, barrios, uh, villas in different uh, countries of the subcontinent. And there, there's been discussion ongoing for at least you know, three decades now of the factors associated with this violence in low income neighborhoods. You know, contendents are you know, unemployment, inequality, the accumulation of structural disadvantages, the lack of what we call collective efficacy. Now, more recently, the absence of what is called social infrastructure and the twin influence of the illicit drug trade and the fragile legi legitimacy of the state monopoly of violence. Our book, The Ambivalent State, focuses on this relationship, on the relationship between these last factors of tra trade and state action, scrutinizing the clandestine connections or what Desmond Arias called, calls the entanglements between participants in the illicit drug trade and members of state security forces. In more than a way, more than a way I was aware, um, the book 
picks up where uh, in harm's way the other, my previous book uh, left off in a sense trying to build without me knowing at first one more step towards what we could call a sort of uh, political sociology of urban marginality that is and I tried to understand the relationship between the state and these uh, urban poor urban areas and poor uh, populations something that again I started without knowing when I first wrote uh, poor people's politics now It is well established, and people here know uh, this well, that policing impacts the dynamics of the illegal drug markets. Policing, most analysts uh, would agree, oftentimes disrupts and displaces, but rarely completely discontinues drug distribution, sometimes encourages militarization of drug trafficking organizations, other time triggering triggers internal conflicts within those illicit organizations. Most research focuses on legal and public interventions, such as arrests of drug market leaders, visibility of this violence, raids, intensified police presence, militarization of police forces, what Foucault would call the visible displays of power, right? Um, and it has examined uh, interactions between two opposing actors whose boundaries are clearly delineated the state repressive apparatus on the one side, the illegal operations on, uh, of drug market groups on the others, forces of order, urban marauders, to use Jackal's expression. Now, far less analytic attention has been paid to the workings of clandestine relationships between police officers and drug market actors. Although these relationships for anybody who's been more than a week in Latin America are very well known Uh, phenomenon in countries, but not just in Latin America, around the world too. Uh, in a very schematic form, if I had a if I had a blackboard here, I was going to bring mine and I forgot. It's I, I focus on on the intersection and interaction where these two presumably separated fields intersect and interact. That area uh, in the in the middle, that relational space. When these relationships between state and drug traffickers are discussed they're often understood as structured by the absence of state intervention. In essence, drug market actors pay police to leave them alone. Drug dealers pay for protection, and this protection takes the form of non-enforcement of laws that regulate the sale and consumption of illegal narcotics. We all know that some officers and sometimes entire police departments protect individual traffickers, sometimes entire drug trafficking organizations. We know that there is complicity, tolerance, acquiescence and or cooperation. We don't know the sort of nitty gritty details of these transactions. How do they take place? How does money for forbearance take place? Beyond non-enforcement, beyond looking elsewhere, what do clandestine relationships between drug market actors and police officers involve? And the question for me most relevant and that I don't think the ambivalent state fully answers, How does this collusion relate to interpersonal violence? So in, in the book, we draw on what I still think, but I might be wrong, you know, we'll wait for the reviews to come in, which is a unique combination of data. Um, ethnographic evidence uh, collected over 30 months of fieldwork in Arquitecto Tucci, which is the same neighborhood I did, for in, I, I, I did fieldwork for in Harm's Way, and documentary evidence of wiretapped uh, conversations, evidence that includes hundreds and hundreds of pages of highly revealing and redacted wiretapped uh, conversations between traffickers and police officers. And so in the interest of time, I'm going to summarize uh, the four arguments uh, we make. I'm just going to tell without showing anything, but you, know, you can always uh, read the book. So first, we argue that illicit relationships between agents, police agents and traffickers go, as I said, well beyond the, the well-established provision of protection by non-enforcement and serve drug dealers to seek an always provisional and always negotiated control over a territory that is central to their illegal drug trade. That is somewhat sort of agreed upon in the literature. Second, we show that police criminal collusion nurtures what criminologists studying U.S. inner cities and ghettos call legal cynicism. A whites and 
and a widespread sense of powerlessness. Residents at the urban margins share the belief that when it comes to the drug trade and controlling the related violence of the drug trade, the state is inept, biased, and that it engages in what we call, in a variation of Chuck Tilly's uh, phrase, disorganized, organized crime. We, what we do, what we, I think we did, is a specifying an additional source of legal cynicism and poor people's resignation to the status quo, a topic that has recently occupied sociologists here in the US, such as Matt uh, Desmond. And the source of this resignation and this frustration and somewhat this apathy is this illicit involvement of state, of state actors in local drug trade. Third, we argue more so by way of empirical demonstration that this set of clandestine relationship between officers and traffickers is recursively related to the systemic violence that oftentimes accompanies the, 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 tra the traffic of illegal uh, drugs and contributes to this sort of violence too that is <coughs> hooking up in uh, poor areas. Fourth, through these collusive interactions, police regulate the market of illicit drugs. Now, in contrast to the standard definition of regulation, a sustained and focused control exercised by a public agency, in our case, the police, this regulation involves neither a specific set of commands nor a deliberate state influence. What it happens is that state forces and drug market actors jointly regulate the market through relationships marked by mistakes, by corrections, by improvisations that often are at cross purposes with other state agencies. We argue then that regulation of drug markets does not follow a planned management strategy, but is an error field, improvised, interactive process. And this idea of errors and improvisations, and I'm concluding with this, speaks to the larger implications of our work. The, the, the question I usually terrorize my own students all the time, which so, so what? Besides the case of police trafficker collusion in Argentina, what is this about? What is this about is that our examination of the errors, the mistakes, the improvisations at the heart of collusive relationships shows that the repressive hands of the state are far from coherent entities. Police agents regulate illicit markets not only through law enforcement, but also through relations that cultivate, that can foster cooperation and contention with illicit actors. So building on theories of the state as this fragmented assemblage of actors and institutions, we argue that when sociologists speak about the many hands of the state, they must pay attention to these clandestine hands. Their actions blur the boundaries between state and, and non-state actors and ultimately highlight what we call this highly ambivalent character uh, of the state. And this, ambivalent, uh, this ambivalence, we argue, is the product not only of multiple and diverse efforts of various agencies, but also of this, the, st the very state actors' surreptitious participation in relations that they themselves define as illegal. So that is a super, super brief summary. I'm trying to manage how to you know, uh, keep the attention of people uh, on Zoom. So I, I try to condense everything in, I don't know, nine minutes, I guess. Uh, so we can talk more uh, later. So that would be from me. Thank you. I think you're muted, Francisco. Yeah, I know the youth number one mistake when you're on Zoom. I was muted. Um, thanks very much. I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions after that, but uh, we now um, want to listen to Lucia. Uh, uh, Lucia, your, the, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's uh, It's been a pleasure to be here with Javier and Juan Pablo, long-term uh, fellows and colleagues. Um, I've been working on this issue of, you know, criminal organizations and police uh, for almost two decades throughout Latin America. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what Javier said because I fully agree with that description. So I just want to start by describing the, the, the context. And as Javier said, we have high levels of, of violence, different types of violence throughout the region. 
Uh, we have street, street violence, street crime, and also organized crime. And it's very difficult, very different to, the, to define and characterize the relationship between the police and street crime robbers, basically, and organized crime organizations. And I think that that's one uh, caveat that we have to um, really highlight. Because, you know, as you can see on the literature in Italy and the literature on mafia in Russia, um, police collusion with organized crime takes him to another level uh, when you are talking about, you know, transnational organized crime. So, of course, we also, you know, share 30 percent of all crime of all homicides in the world, even though uh, we represent 8 percent of the population. And one of the most important things is that that crime has geography. So uh, we know now that 50% of all crimes are, you know, are highly concentrated between three and 7.5% of the streets uh, segments throughout Latin America. Um, so it's not something that the police doesn't know. The police do know how to handle violence. Violence is not being handled effectively because of other reasons, and some of them Javier uh, touched upon. Um, of course, homicides and most criminal organizations are located in the same urban areas, mostly, you know, what uh, Javier called name uh, urban margins. Um, but also in that context, what is uh, going on with the police, um, you know? Um, and the police, as Manny said, it's, it has an impossible mandate, you know, it, it, ha it has to deal with the causes of crime uh, and the causes of crime are very far from what they can actually tackle as, uh, you know, they have social roots. And of course, they also have the direct application of the state monopoly of force. But in many Latin American countries, they are still doing a lot of political policing. Take a look at Nicaragua now, or Venezuela now, or Bolivia. So it's not that they are actually, you know, crime control and crime prevention people. They are actually doing a lot of political work. And my sense at looking at the Chilean as well as the, the, the Honduran case and the Peruvian case in which are working now uh, is that that political policy, it also, um, plays a role in this ambivalent uh, uh, state of, you know, of, of role. So the, the second um, concept is that, that, that I think applies to Latin American police is that, you know, police work in democracy has a double face as Anderson mentioned, you know, on the one hand it's a strong arm, arm of the government in charge of multiple tasks at the macro level, that task that has been increasing in the, lay, in the last two decades. But on the other hand, is also the protector of citizens at the micro level. And there is, um, although most Latin Americans uh, do not trust their police officers, they require more police to their elected politicians. So this paradox has also uh, take, need to be taken into account when we look at the role of the ambivalent state. So uh, in that context, Latin American police institutions in general uh, have low levels of citizen trust, have low levels of efficiency uh, in either crime control or crime prevention, uh, but it has also, they, uh, they show high levels of personal and institutional corruption practices. And of course, uh, discretionary use of force. So uh, the ambivalent state, um, you know, um, as Aria said, you know, this is this uh, Desmond Arias, the, the police criminal collusion, and of course, Javier Ullero's uh, book that I read in English, but I'm looking forward to reading in Spanish. Um, you know, this, this, the, the development of these um, state sponsored protection rackets, as uh, Angelica Duran Martinez mentioned in the case of Colombia, I think it's pretty much spread out throughout Latin America. However, the police is, is not the only state institution playing that ambivalent role. And I think that we need to figure out how the whole criminal justice system works. And my sense, um, uh, looking at the Peruvian case in this process is that 
Police perhaps is not even the stronger institution linked to this ambivalent role. Um, so uh, looking into the Peruvian case that uh, I've been invited to talk about this, um, I did uh, ethnographic work uh, for many, many months in Peru. We actually uh, were in 20 police prisons in, uh, in Lima, most in the urban margins. And we had a, a group of um, researchers actually, you know, within the police presence for months. Um, so most of the work that I will refer now are based on that type of policy, not, you know, high level policy, drug trafficking, special units and so on and so forth. So in Peru, we have limited police presence. In most uh, areas, police is highly concentrated in, in, in presence within comisarias without really you know, patrolling any streets or doing any of the, of the regular policing uh, work. Uh, in fact, community policing tasks are very secondary to what they should be doing in those areas. And most of the initiatives they do are, you know, like school talks or haircuts for everyone, you know, really not related to the main concern of citizens. And, and that's something that this is spread out Latin American too. So none of those actually work for either control or prevent crime. They try to build some type of um, coherent uh, relationship with the community. Um, what they do very effectively though, is they uh, develop a close relationship with uh, local commerce and local stakeholders, not only criminal, but also legal. Um, and they, even though they're legal, they also buy protection. So you can see the local police officer, you know, um, located in front of the supermarket or, you know, the main, uh, you know, street vendor, and they're not there by chance, they're being paid to do that. So there is a culture, a general culture of selling protection. Of course, they sell protection to legal uh, places, they also sell protection to illegal. Um, Police in Peru is allowed to work uh, in their free time as guards. And that's also part of the you know, structural problem that we face over there. Um, looking at uh, the poli policing of the drug world, as Javier mentioned, we have anecdotal evidence of you know, collusion uh, of police and drug traffickers at the local level. But, Peru is a special case because Peru is the most important producer of cocaine in the world. Also, uh, there are increasing levels of informality and a culture of illegality that allows for a huge gray area. You know, that gray area that Javier was, uh, uh, was explaining in Peru is almost, you know, it's a completely overposing one of the other. Um, and drug trafficking has penetrated multiple state institutions, local politics, and the private sector uh, linked to the international drug market. However, there is also an important internal demand of drugs. And in that, at that level uh, is in the urban margins where drug trafficking uh, is linked to other multiple illegal markets. So. Uh, the collusion, the police criminal collusion is not only, uh, is not linked only to drugs, but also gangs, migrants, and most, most importantly, extortion. So um, extortion is a, be is a better business for them now. And that's one of the things that we realized because, you know, if you are caught uh, trafficking drugs, well, you know, you can go to jail but no one will uh, report a policeman uh, asking them for money in order to protect them. No one will you know, do that. So extortion has become in, 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 in Peru a very important part of how the police actually work in the urban margins. Um, specifically in those areas, um, police corruption is normalized. You know, you talk to people and they realize that paying to the police to do their job is just normal. It's part of what they do. And in Peru, <clears throat> there is a long history 
of explaining corruption because of the low wages, low police wages. And that happens in Argentina for a long time, also when I lived there. <clears throat> now they have better wages, but still, you know, corruption has been normalized. Uh, and of course, corruption is linked to inefficiency, quote unquote, uh, in crime control and protection. So you pay them not only to be in front of your house, but also in order to concentrate in some crimes and not others. Um, linkages to local gangs is evident in some specific areas, not throughout all urban margins, but there is limited structural involvement with criminal organizations at the local level. So my sense and our research shows that um, there is an increasing concern of more structural involvement of specialized units rather than local police. And I'm not sure is if Javier um, uh, were tapping where, you know, um, emphasize or, or focalize on those police officers at the local level, but um, my sense is that at the local level, you can find, you know, regular corruption and extortion practices, but the specialized units are those who are actually, you know, uh, deepening their relationship with these type of, of criminal organizations. Police officers are mostly passive observers of high levels of violence on the streets, and sometimes, you know, they help a little bit. They are anecdotal evidence of that, too. Um, limited investigative capacities, though, play an important role because, you know, impunity is also being uh, sold on the streets. You know, you can also pay police uh, not to investigate. And that's a different, you know, that's a, another part of the, in the structure of, of ambivalence, uh, of ambivalent state in the criminal uh, justice system. That's a different, a different sector. So what happened with citizens? We learned that uh, citizens believe that the police is not really interested in fighting crime, uh, that enforces the culture of illegality, of course, that runs very deep in most areas in, in Peru and has allowed for lynching as well as other forms of vigilantism to arise. Because of course, police is over there doing their business. No one really knows what their business are though. Um, however, there is a huge culture of silence that is consolidating for fear of police uh, discretionary use of violence. So the police do their business and citizens feel like kidnapped in the middle of this, you know, process of abandonment, but mostly, you know, uh, possible repression or possible vi police violence. However, and this, uh, this is something that we need to stress. Most people goes to, who go to police presence continues to require police help to solve regular issues of violence, such as violence against women or neighborhood disputes. So it's not that people really hate the police and they do not want to have police officers on their streets, even though they know that police is not efficient and most of the time work for criminal organizations or you know, passive or act in a passive or active way. In fact, they continue to require most, more police officers or more police presence. So, and this is my last point. So um, in this ambivalent uh, state, uh, in the case of Peru, we need to include a different uh, actor, uh, which is the political mafia. And, you know, crime has penetrated not only the police, but local and regional politics in Peru. There is ample evidence of criminal organizations linked to drug trafficking with strong ties to those levels of government, uh, not only in the urban margins, but also in cities around the country. In that context, the police criminal collusion should be understood as a piece of a greater and more complex structure, uh, at least in the Peruvian case. I think uh, in other cases is uh, a bit different. Uh, perhaps this is also the case throughout Central America, some, some countries in the Caribbean, some areas in Brazil, some areas in Mexico, and, and perhaps you know, we can discuss a little bit in, in Argentina. So the development of a mafia type of organization that have political as well as police power allow us for a broader question on the role of the state. 
And this is the question that I just leave my colleagues to discuss. So do we have in Peru an ambivalent state or a criminal state? Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Um, now, uh, last but not least, uh, Juan Pablo. Uh, thanks so much, and thanks for the, the invitation. It's really uh, a pleasure and an honor to, to share the room with colleagues I, I, whose work I admire so much. Um, this is, uh, what I'll be presenting today, it's uh, something that dovetails with what Lucia just said. Uh, in, it's a, a joint project with Andreas Feldman, and we are trying to understand uh, multi-level interactions among organized crime politicians and state agents. Uh, we are preliminary calling this uh, criminal politics uh, and, and trying to understand how this works in relation to organized crime in, in different places in Latin America. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, our general framework, where we come from, uh, and we come from different places. I mean, from uh, Andreas focuses more in, on, on international relations and international political economy of crime. Uh, I work more on, on, on comparative politics and, and, and state and, 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 and representation. So we are kind of foreign to the, the literature on, 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 on crime. Uh, and we are trying to engage with that literature from our uh, own, own perspectives and, and origins. Um, so what I will do is uh, first present the, the, the general framework of, of, of around which we are trying to, to work. Uh, and then if there is time, I will say some things about uh, our current uh, uh, field work, uh, seeking to understand how Chile plays out and how criminal politics in Chile plays out uh, in, in, in contemporary times. So the gist of the argument that, that we are trying to push with this, with this piece is uh, there are multiple interactions, entanglements among state agents, politicians, and organized crime players. Uh, sometimes these uh, entanglements are vertically integrated. Sometimes they are more local or, uh, or, or function in parallel across different local or functional arenas. Uh, but they are all uh, characterized by the uh, these gray areas, these uh, like entanglements, these uh, mafia interactions between uh, or among politicians, state agents, and organized crime uh, players. Uh, we will argue that this is, uh, these interactions are reshaping uh, the, the nature of state institutions and democratic institutions in, in, throughout the region uh, in ways that we uh, that get traditionally obscured, uh, in our view, uh, if we merely focus on uh, visible interactions or visible uh, outputs of, 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 of criminal activities such as open violence or corruption scandals dealing with, uh, like, uh, when, when this collusion gets in, into the, the open air. Yet, uh, we know this is uh, important and has crucial implications for the nature of state institutions, for democratic uh, institutions in, in the region. But it's very difficult to do research on this, and it's particularly difficult to uh, seek analytical aggregation, right? And in terms of how these local gray zones and these uh, functional entanglements that uh, Lucia and, and Javier uh, talked about play out at, at, at the systemic level, right? Uh, if they do, I mean, in some cases, uh, this happens in, 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 in a very disaggregated form, and in some other cases, uh, you have more aggregation and more uh, like uh, vertical integration into in, 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 in this criminal politics, or what we call criminal politics. Uh, we start with uh, uh, like a, a review and a critical review of three different literatures, the, the literature on new violence that like uh, shows these upward trends in violence in, 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 in the region, uh, the literature on state capacity and the quality of institutions that uh, eventually from a very uh, path dependent point of view argued that uh, countries with 
a strong state uh, would have an antidote to, uh, to, to, to criminal politics and, and, and that like, these strong state institutions would uh, in a way shy away uh, criminal, criminal politics. And we, we think that's not the case and that's kind of what we are uh, seeing through the, the, spreading, the spreading out of, of criminal politics uh, throughout uh, Latin America. And then uh, the, 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 the literature on the new literature on criminal governance, clandestine orders, gray zones that has contributed a lot in order to understand uh, local hotspots in which uh, uh, different types of interactions between uh, organized crime, police, politicians uh, uh, play out, uh, but which needs to be uh, like aggregated into, into uh, uh, other areas of, of, of society, other areas of politics in which organized crime is also present, right? And, and we don't know much about uh, by, by, by only looking and focusing on these uh, uh, territorial hotspots. So even if, uh, and, and I completely uh, concur with Lucia, I mean, we, we usually have this focus on narco trafficking, but uh, organized crime is much more broader than this and, and, and many other uh, activities are uh, becoming important for, uh, for, for the networks and the gangs we are trying to, to, to understand. But even if only we look at narco trafficking uh, activities, you, you, you can uh, readily identify different types of uh, activities associated to the narco trafficking chain and those activities, production, micro-trafficking, micro-trafficking, and money laundering, uh, engage with uh, different local and territorial uh, places, right? And, and, and take place in, in, in different sites in society. Those, in those sites, there are different state actors that are relevant to, to, to understand and to analyze in relation to, to those activities. They also engage different political actors that have jurisdictional power in, 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 in those localities or, or, or functional arenas. Uh, and there are other actors and legal enterprises that also uh, enter into a relationship with uh, this, this uh, uh, narco trafficking uh, or, or criminal activities. Right? So we're trying to uh, like sort out how uh, like the international political economy of narco-trafficking interacts with countries' own competitive advantages for uh, narco-trafficking activities and how uh, that um, like, uh, pressure for uh, uh, or, or those, those trends in terms of like uh, that, that, that relate to, to increased activities related to narco-trafficking uh, finally interact with countries' own state institutions and political systems in ways that uh, uh, produce relevant uh, outcomes and, and, and implications for society. So uh, this is kind of the, the, what we are trying to, to, to understand in, in like, or, or trying to propose as a framework for analyzing these uh, complex interactions. Uh, the dependent variable is criminal politics, which we defined as an array of local and functional gray zones uh, that get structured across and a, 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 around uh, different activities related to narco trafficking. Those have impacts on violence and corruption as a first order implication, but they also reconfigure the ways in which states and uh, democratic institutions uh, work. And, and play out in, in countries, right? And this fits back into, into initial conditions. And in terms of explanatory variables, we uh, argue that uh, there are external factors that have to do with transnational political economy of, of organized crime activities, countries' competitive advantages, pre-existing criminal actors and interface between legal and illegal industries across the retirement and factional arenas, and politicians and state agents incentives and behavior in relation to those uh, networks and, 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 the, and the political economy of crime. Right. Um, so this is what we are trying to uh, track down uh, and, and seeking to uh, provide some vertical integration to 
research that we think has been uh, so far very encapsulated at the, at the, at the local level or at uh, specific outcomes related to violence and corruption uh, when aggregated the, uh, outcomes are, are, are aggregated level outcomes are, are uh, analyzed and observed. Uh, so far, I mean, we have done uh, primary research in Chile and Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay. Uh, we are pending, have Argentina pending, but Argentina has so much good research and the pandemic has been so disruptive that we might uh, eventually not, uh, not get there. Essentially, these are kind of general hypotheses on uh, how different elements uh, that uh, structure this relationship between politicians, organized crime, and state agents play out in, in, in these cases. Uh, and there are different types of factors and different configurations that we think are, uh, are relevant to, to, to track down what's happening in, in, in the region and in each country of the region according to its, their own uh, uh, divergent patterns. It, just like I have four minutes, uh, I'll try to touch on the, on the Chilean case in, in brief. I mean, given that Diego asked me to, to talk a little bit about, uh, about Chile, uh, we have been doing some, some field work uh, on uh, micro-trafficking and money laundering in, in Chile. We are still uh, needing to do much more in terms of macro-trafficking. I probably have only time to uh, talk about micro-trafficking, but if you have questions on micro-trafficking or, or, or money laundering, I, I'm happy to, to, to address those in the Q&A. In terms of micro-trafficking, uh, something that it's, uh, again, uh, a, a bias we are trying to uh, counteract is that we usually uh, focus on marginal communities, and there is a lot of things happening there. Uh, but also micro-trafficking happens in wealthy neighborhoods, and we're trying to understand how uh, like dealers in upper sectors of society uh, work, right? Uh, in marginal communities, what we see is a transition ongoing, still incipient between uh, 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 very decentralized networks of family clans, right, uh, distributing uh, drugs in, in, in these neighborhoods to intermediate level organizations that have great integration with decentralized networks of imports and distributors, right? Uh, before, uh, it was more a shop type of, of uh, business structure in which they bought from uh, distributors and, and, and importers. Now we are seeing some vertical integration in the criminal networks, uh, but yet uh, it's, it's still limited. Uh, these have produced, uh, in, uh, at least, I mean, according to, to the interviews we have been uh, doing during these last two years, uh, increasing territorial disputes between gangs. Uh, this has to do in part through uh, the struggle over deposits, uh, given uh, closures in, in, and, and, and less availability of, 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 of drugs in, 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 in the economy, given like uh, restrictions associated to COVID-19. Uh, but also, I mean, uh, like micro, micro traffickings are uh, increasingly talking to us about uh, like efforts by the gangs to centralize. Right and and gangs that are getting more hierarchical and that are getting that have more outlets, uh, but at the same time are placing those outlets in a in a more hierarchical type of uh, uh, scheme. Right. Uh, in terms of the relationship with the police, we see all the time uh, uh, stories that resemble a lot what. Uh, Javier and others described in, in, in the ambivalent state, clandestine uh, type of, of, of dealings that entail protection packs uh, with uh, like different gangs being protected by different brigades of, of, of carabineros or uh, policia investigaciones, sometimes very small groups within uh, brigades, right? Sometimes it goes up to uh, stations, right? In, in some cases you see a whole commissaria being uh, associated to the protection of, of, of some gang. Um, 
this changes over time and gets disrupted over time. And this also has to do with the fragmentation of police forces and police enforcement uh, in, in, into these neighborhoods. Uh, and you also see an increase in engagement with political, uh, with municipal level politicians. Uh, there is a very high profile case in the southern uh, region of, of, of metropolitan Santiago. But also if you go to other places in the country, like the Quinta Region or the northern border, you see uh, and, and you hear about uh, um, council members, mayors, and some uh, like uh, reference to Congress members and parties uh, being uh, part of these protection rackets with uh, narco trafficking acts. Uh, in terms of uh, municipal governments, uh, licensing for local, uh, for instance, alcohol selling facilities, uh, it's becoming uh, referenced, uh, frequently referenced to as a way in which uh, local gangs uh, launder their money uh, through, uh, and, 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 and this is a mechanism through which they, they, they get connections to, to municipal level uh, authorities. Uh, regarding micro trafficking, micro trafficking in wealthy neighborhoods, uh, here you have a very decentralized network of individual sellers buying from distributors. Centralization is among distributors, not about, uh, 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 among uh, like the, 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 the individual sellers. And what you hear here from them is that uh, if detected, I mean, and if detained uh, eventually with, uh, with, with drugs or in dealing drugs, uh, you see forbearance and that forbearance is not uh, like propitiated by uh, 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 corruption, but essentially by uh, it, it's associated to class or to or to the individual's network. They call their mom. Their mom comes to the commissaria and the carabiner free them. Right. That that's kind of the, the usual story we get uh, from 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 many of these uh, like upper class micro dealers uh, in that, that we are seeking to interview in, in, in this case. Uh, I'll leave it there. I mean, I'm, I'm already over time. And thanks. Okay, um, thank you very much. We, we have about 25 minutes or so for um, questions and answers. Um, of course, <clears throat> let me just, start using the, the so-called chair privilege to ask a question to all of you. Um, Javier um, was, was saying, uh, saying that the question that he terrorized his students. Um, I have a, a, a fellow um, colleague from the LSC that teach public policy. And the question that he does that terrorize his students is nothing works, discussed in terms of public policy. Uh, so is that the case for um, attempts to control in uh, diminishing um, criminality? Um, apparently that's the case, nothing works. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, can, I, can I say something? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I I honestly don't know the answer to that, but I I, I it would be it would go against um, the way in which we actually collect uh, our data, which is like the courts are trying to. I mean, th we access this data because of wiretappings. They are trying to uh, do something about uh, the issue. They are, there's a lot of inertia in the way in which they deal with uh, the, the, the issue of uh, drug distribution and drug consumption, which is through punitive means. In, within that logic, uh, which I don't agree, but within the logic, they are trying to do something. The fact that they are, you know, wiretapping uh, cops and, uh, and, and dealers says something. The fact that the book only focuses on on the lower echelons of the uh, trade means that they are not wiretapping those where the money goes to, which is, you know, officials, politicians. I haven't seen, and this is very much, I mean, I know all the problems of, you know, uh, building 
a research project around sort of inductive uh, ways. This was very inductive, right? It's like we were allowed, we, were, we accessed this kind of data and we sort of uh, did an analysis around this, but we fully know and we suspect based on more anecdotal evidence that this goes all the way up and this finances uh, political campaigns, which in turn, those officials appoint these uh, local officers. So all, all I'm saying, is, I'm not sort of escaping the question, is that there are things that are being uh, done. Um, to what effect? That's another uh, question. But it's not that the state is not doing anything. That's precisely its ambivalent uh, character. And I, uh, in my, in my, and I'm going to, stop here but in my days in which they have the 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 glass is half empty i would agree with uh, lucia this is a criminal state in w- the days in which the glass is half full i would agree with this it's ambivalent state because you know they're trying to do something about it but you know i agree with lucia in, in, in today for example <laughs> sorry that was my way of saying lucia say something that res- you know rescues me from this yeah. Uh, so, Lucia, if, if the state is a criminal state, the state cannot be part of the solution, it's, it's part of the problem. So what is there to be done? Yeah, well, I think that, uh, you know, Latin America is very is very different from one place to the other. I think uh, Peru uh, and some parts of Mexico and some parts of um, Argentina, the Gran Buenos Aires, uh, they could be, you know, depicted as criminal states. However, Uh, There are other parts of Latin America who cannot. And I will call it criminal state because politicians who run the party right now are in the process of fighting some criminal organization. Uh, In that sense, I I believe what uh, Javier is saying is not that the, 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 the the politicians or the state is doing nothing. They are fighting some criminal organizations, but take a look at what happened in Mexico. They were fighting the others and they were getting money from the chapel criminal organizations. So one of the problems with, in, in working with these areas, one is that police is, uh, is very effective of, as you know, telling their own stories. And second, you can just see some part of the real you know, huge picture. And that part is that the state is actually enforcing some policies. My sense is that those policies are not, you know, randomly uh, or uh, implemented, but they are more focalized. So if you go and take a look, who are the, and this is another project that we did in Peru, who are the criminal organizations that are being detained by the police? Uh, In most cases, they are from specific areas of, you know, the country, they are not linked to political, you know, ra- grassroots organizations. Uh, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that they are fighting with the police situations before. So um, um, this mafia style of politics that, you know, we have been learning a lot from Italy and even Japan and other places is something that, that shows you that they can be effective when they want. And that's precisely why you pay the police, because otherwise you go to jail. And that's why you finance some politicians, you know, because you know that if you finance them, then you can get more leverage in order to not only go doing your business, but also laundering your money into public works. So, of course, the the state can do a lot, uh, but my... Um, you know, my more public policy uh, hat will tell you that we need to change politicians first. It's not, you know, it's it's not the the institutions. It's the problem of the politicians that are walking on this thin line between illegality and informality. Um, This thin line on, you know, um, criminal financing of of, of politics. Um, and in that sense, we really need to, you know, focus on uh, when Juan Pablo said that there is, you know, very encapsulated literature. Um, I think that this, you know, the more recent literature that focus on a specific um, cases, 
allow us to move forward and say, well, you know, there are structural reforms that have to be taken into account. But of course, Javier shows you that, you know, uh, the judicial system is somehow working, but I wouldn't say that it's really effectively working against all, you know, organized crime organizations. It's working and, and that's it, you know, thanks. Um, Juan Pablo, um, you mentioned the, the theory that the countries have a stronger state capacity and maybe less corruption and the, the usual three countries everybody talks about, Uruguay, Chile, and Costa Rica. Uh, and you said uh, it didn't work. It doesn't really, uh, if I understood you well anyway, uh, it doesn't mean that they, they, they haven't been particularly successful in bringing down criminality. Uh, maybe I didn't understand you, but can you clarify whether state capacity makes a difference and what kind of difference or degree or what? Uh, we like uh, we started looking at, at, at Chile and Uruguay because uh, like all the literature expected those countries to be more resilient to uh, criminal politics and in our research uh, criminal politics started to show up all the time right uh, I, I, I started looking at this when I was researching political parties at the at the local level and like narco trafficking and organized crime schemes uh, appear all the time in, 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 in relation to political parties, right? So in both countries, right? Uh, so I, I think that, that there is a point that, that uh, it, we, we, it has been stressed by Javier and by, and by Lucia, and I think it's, it's worth stressing one more time. Uh, there is no point uh, at buying a state that is not uh, strong enough to, to, to do anything, right? I mean, you only buy a state that is able to, uh, like, forbear what they can do, right? And, 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 and that's a, 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 an important mechanism behind this. Uh, for instance, I mean, in terms of, like, uh, traditional politics in Uruguay, uh, like, was, uh, and, and still is, according to custom agents we, we, we were uh, interviewing in, in, in the country, it's one of the main sources of party financing in the country, right? And and uh, and and these are the same parties that then, uh, like uh, on the other hand, and and here's the ambivalence, uh, push for custom reform and custom modernization and and, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, I think that like uh, uh, and and again, I mean. Uh, like no matter what these countries did, for instance, in case of, of, of Uruguay, you have the legalization of, of marijuana, for instance, uh, and, and the expectation that that would create uh, a, a reduction of margins and so on. And, and, and you have like an increase in homicidal violence related to our, uh, our types of, 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 of drugs and, and, and uh, the expansion of criminal activities happening in the country. Right? And, uh, and, and, and the case of Uruguay is interesting because also you had uh, a, a series of police reforms that uh, uh, in, in a way increase enforcement against this and, and lead to something that Lucia referred to as uh, that happened in the case of Mexico, that is the fragmentation of, ga of gangs and, and the escalation of violence among gangs and the police uh, uh, leading to like greater incarceration rates, greater homicidal uh, violence rate. Uruguay today has uh, double homicide rates than Argentina or, or, or uh, and, and three times more than Chile, right? And it's the most democratic and better able state in, in, in the region. Right? Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, I have a question from, from the public. Uh, so it's uh, from Chase Madar, uh, and the question is, do these theories of an insight into the relationship uh, between state, non-state violence also applies to the United States? I guess this is a little bit outside the, the topic of that, but if any of you want to say something about that, you're most welcome. Well, I, I think we, I mean, if you look at, we've been 
I've been skimming through wiretaps in the Chicago Police Department, and and there's plenty of evidence. Uh, still, I mean, there's plenty of evidence of you know these relationships between gangs and 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 cops. Still, that literature that I was referring to that talks about these two very discrete uh, camps comes from the United States. There's really not a lot of work other than stuff on the border uh, that talks about acquiescence, complicity, et cetera, et cetera, in big, you know, inner city violence that talks about these relationships. It would be up to, you know, scrutinize uh, further. I also want to say one thing about, you know, what is to be done in relationship to what Juan Pablo and, and Lucia just said. If we take, you know, we take the lessons from, you know, social movements in Latin America, I mean, it would be impossible to think about changing sort of reproductive rights or, you know, women's rights without thinking about social movements. Recent examples, you know, in Argentina and elsewhere. Same thing with human rights. I don't want to sound too sort of optimistic, but nothing will change about this without really strong collective action. The example of Italy is the, probably the best example. The, 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 the relevance of mafia within the state radically change, and this is, you know, reversible destiny by the Schneiders, talked about this. Yes, because they isolated judges. Yes, because something happened at the state level, but mostly because of the push from civil society actors. So I don't want to sound again too like, oh, this is going to happen. But, you know, recent lessons from human rights and from, you know, the feminist movement show that this could happen with alliances, strategic alliances within sectors of the state. So, I know I'm sounding now the glass is half uh, full again. Uh, sorry. Um, I, I can I just say something to empty the glass. Uh, like, <laughs> the, the problem is like for 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 collective action, uh, and and this is something we 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 get all the time through through field work, and I guess you too. I mean, is that the legitimacy of the state? Right uh, and and the legitimacy of political institutions and so on. Like people is really uh, throughout Latin America disenchanted with democratic politics, with the state institutions, and uh, more and more reliant uh, at the territorial level and the local level on uh, gangs and organizations that are sometimes more legitimate than the state. Right, and and that's a, a fundamental mechanism I think undercutting the type of uh, collective action you, 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 you want to see. I, sorry, so can we, can we talk? But I, I fully ag agree with you. And I remember, you know, joining this rally in, in the neighborhood I was doing field work with uh, at, and, you know, we cut, you know, we blockade the road, making claims, et cetera, et cetera. And everybody there knew that they were making a claim to the police precinct that was corrupt. That didn't stop them from marching, though. So, and I, yeah. I agree. I mean, they were saying these are all corrupt. They were all bought by their narco traffickers, and they still organized and kept uh, marching. So, I, I, I mean, this is not uh, against your your claim. Is that I, I I highly doubt that this is this is this if there is change is going to come only from within some well intended bureaucrat or politician from within the state without any outside, okay. yeah. that, that, that's all, that, yeah. that's all. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. feel like with that. I just wanna mention that uh, regarding the question on the gray area, <clears throat> one of the, perhaps, one of the most important uh, characteristic of police institutions in Latin America is the high levels of, of political autonomy. Uh, so in fact, you know, you can have really criminal organizations within the police uh, that really no one knows. Um, those levels of, of political autonomy, uh, autonomy are, are less in the US. And that doesn't mean that, of course, uh, there is no relationship between cops and criminal organizations or criminals specifically. But the fact that you know, there is more transparency, there is more accountability. Uh, you, know, you, can, you can fight uh, the unions, but you know who the unions are and how the leverage they have, uh, you know, who the lobbyists for the police uh, are, et cetera. Here in Latin America, everything is so opaque. You don't, you don't really know, you know who the police, uh, who, who is the police 
lobbyists, for instance, or who is talking for the police at the political realm. And in terms of the of what you were discussing, Juan Pablo and Javier, I I fully agree. I think that you know um, social movements are a way to um, change things. However, and this is the glass is broken. <laughs> um, however, I just have to mention that in many cases in Latin America, social movements are linked to criminal issues are looking for you know tougher penalties for more police faculties for more you know, um, iron fist for super mano duras, recontra super mano dura and things like that. So we don't have to, uh, I just want to uh, put the element of the authoritarian Latin American person, you know, who is out, out there, um, who is actually changing uh, laws and policies, but instead of moving towards, you know, a more lenient, more progressive type of um, police reform or, you know, crime control initiatives, they are moving on the other side for more, you know, control uh, of people, you know, more drones, et cetera, and so on and so forth. So um, that has to also be into account, you know, the Bloombergs, uh, all those movements uh, that happen throughout Argentina, Mexico, Peru, and other countries um, shows us that, you know, law and order is very deep into, uh, you know, societal um, elements or characteristics. Okay, I think I have time. We have time for one last question. Uh, that is for uh, Sabri H. Um, and ask to what extent the current precarious economic situation in Latin America can influence these collusive police trafficker relations. So. The, the, the economic question, I think, is, is broader than the current situation. It's the, the whole political economy of, of, of crime. And so, uh, the, sorry, can I? I mean, the only, and this is anecdotal evidence from current uh, ethnographic fieldwork, is that as a, as sort of, even informal sources of employment dry up. Uh, People, you know, poor people, the ones that we are, you know, now following in a squatter settlement are either pushed to, towards the state, and we see sort of record levels of state assistance programs inundating these neighborhoods, or, and or push more into uh, illicit uh, activities that still provide uh, sort of economic uh, opportunities. The, the local drug dealers are now the prestamistas in the, 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 the they are the ones you know like local banks you know bo, you know people borrow money from uh, dealers there is still a lot of you know uh, economic ac activity there and so uh, my sense is that uh, this crisis that according to the, I, I was reading the book by Gabriel Kessler and, and Gabriela Benz about the impact of covid throughout Latin America, you know, uh, this seems to be in the future more, more so than in the past. This, this is going to, uh, uh, this form of illicit uh, economic activity will uh, remain and will provide more and more incentives to sort of collude and to relate to those who can protect you. I just, um, just a, a little bit, um, I think that uh, what happened in Italy and Europe that, you know, illegal money is buying the whole, you know, hotels and the tourist industry and how, you know, illegal markets, uh, not only drugs, but, you know, the trafficking of migrants, human trafficking, illegal, you know, mining and so on and so forth. Uh, they do have money and they are, um, you know, held in hostage some citizens, of course, but they are also developing some beneficiaries uh, and some, you know, schemes to help people too. But um, one of the, the things that we also need to see is, uh, as I mentioned in Italy, is, you know, how these, these money that are coming from illegal markets are getting longer and how big this gray area of, you know, um, legal slash illegal organizations and, and complete industries are being developed uh, now under COVID. And of course, because of the economic crisis that Latin America is facing, 
no one is fighting, you know, uh, industries or economic activities that are flourishing. You, you do not wanna, you know, even know where the money comes from, but you do want, you know, something to flourish in these, you know, very difficult times. Yeah, <clears throat> if I, uh, like, we, we also see the, the Prestamista scheme, uh, people hiding drugs for like, given this push over deposit, uh, people hiding small amount of, of drugs for, for gangs, etc. Gangs providing social assistance to, to soup kitchens, uh, much better than what the government provides or the state provides and so on. But something I wanted to, to, to uh, like mention is that we are also like, and, 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 and I, I think this is important to track down like the, the large impact of, 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 uh, of narco-traffic and unorganized crime in society. Uh, we are also always focusing on, the, on, 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 on poverty and on, on poor settlements and, and neighborhoods. Uh, and, and this is also a bias that the state has, right? And, and it, it's reflected in incarceration, who gets prosecuted for this and so on. Uh, in terms of money laundering, uh, we are like working with the with the Chilean uh, agency for money laundering. They had a uh, in the last three years they reported a uh, 400 uh, uh, increase in reports of uh, uh, suspicious activities, money laundering suspicious activities. When they went back and see uh, like the characteristics of those uh, uh, reports no single one of them uh, involved bank clients. These are reports that the banks fill to, to, to the agency. No single one of them, uh, and these are hundreds by the day, right? Uh, included customers that had uh, preferential accounts in, in, in the banking system. They were all the cheapest accounts. It was all popular sectors showing up irregular movements in their accounts. So. We are not looking at where the margins are being made, uh, where the, the big money is being made, uh, and, and where the eventual political connections and state connections are, uh, if, if we are only looking at these uh, hotspots, um, which, which are crucial to understand the, the process. Uh, but, but the politics of, of this uh, should be scaled up. Yeah, and, and, and Juan Pablo, we were just saying with, with Lucia, um, I, I recently read a paper, and this speaks to the, the the question about you know if this happening in the United States. There's no way of explaining you know the the building boom in Miami, a city that is sinking, by the way, uh, without understanding money laundering from trafficking throughout Latin America. And th this is has been documented, and I fully agree. It's always easier to look at the weaker and high and that's more visible parts of uh, society uh, than than those who, you know, uh, are, are, are much more difficult to access, uh, such as, you know, uh, real estate brokers, et cetera, in, in Miami, right? Yeah, I, I think that uh, what you said about Miami, it applies to Punta del Este as well as, as far as I as Probably, understand. Yeah. Uh, so we are bang on time to close this. Uh, I guess that one of the few positive of this situation that uh, we are able to organize a seminar with people in three different countries and in three different time zones that would be perhaps unthinkable uh, be before that. But uh, uh, I think we are looking forward also to the time we can have this uh, seminars live and meet in person. And uh, but in in in, in so far uh, a big thanks to all of you, a big thanks to Diego for organizing that, and a big thanks to uh, all the people that are watching this. That will be available in the London School of Economic Government Department YouTube channel. 